want a capture of target, all you really want for your camera to capture is the photons that came from your target and the sky around it. Unfortunately, you're also going to capture photons that come from undesirable sources. Dynamic background extraction is an interactive tool designed to help you remove unwanted signal areas in your image. These signals are non-uniformities, most often seen as gradients, which can be due to atmospherics and light pollution, air glow, or even moonlight. And in some cases, you can get vignetting due to optical effects of your system. Now, not every image suffers from gradients or vignetting, so you don't, if you don't have the problem, there's no reason to apply DVE. You can skip it. But from my experience, most of my images have benefited from using DVE to remove gradients that exist within the data. The DVE process has an awful lot of controls and a lot of things that can be set to change how it performs. It looks like it could be quite complicated to learn. But fortunately, you don't really have to learn everything in order to use it for the most common situations. If you have a more complex or unusual gradient that needs to be dealt with, then take the time to learn the individual controls of the tool. But you don't need that to get started. DBE is best used for linear images and is one of the first things you will deal with once you've cropped out the messy edges that can come to an image through the stacking process. What we want to remove is unwanted signals. It is therefore best to remove this early in the process so that your image no longer has these signals that can be there to influence the subsequent processing that you do. If you're dealing with an RGB image, you sort of have a decision to make. You can run DBE on the color image, or you can run it on each layer going into that color image. In general, it's better to run on each layer as gradients can be different by color and it's easier to assess and correct one layer at a time. If you're dealing with a one-shot color camera, your images are already color, but you can extract the three layers, the red, green, and blue layers, and run DBE for each and then use channel combination to put the image back together. You could also choose just to run this on the color image. It may not give you the best result, but it'll probably give you a pretty darn good result and might be adequate for your needs. But even if you do this one layer at a time, you might still have some residual color gradients once you added the image together. And there's nothing wrong with running DBE again to remove this from the color image. For narrow band, it's very similar. It's best to run it on each layer and then combine the layers. And if you find some color gradients are still residual, they can be addressed. Now let's talk about how to handle these gradients. As we talked about, gradients are undesired light, typically overlaying the light from the primary signal. Typically, it's seen as a non-uniformity across the image. For example, in this image of M101, we can see that I have a gradient, gradient that exists in this image. You can see that it's darker on this side and it's progressively lighter on this side. And actually, if you look carefully, you can see it's darker towards the bottom than it is in the top. So we have a kind of gradient here that's kind of going off across the image in a 45 degree line. Since gradients are an additive phenomena, they can best be dealt with by subtracting them back out of the image while it's still linear. On the other hand, if we're talking about vignetting, which are due to optical effects like the cosine fourth fall off of a lens or inner reflections in the optical path, these tend to be multiplicative in nature rather than additive. So it's often best to remove them not by subtracting, but by dividing them out. The best way to deal with these kinds of effects is not by using DBE, it's by having really good flat calibration images and using the flat calibration process to take these non-uniformities out of the image. Occasionally you'll have some residual fall off that isn't completely handled by the flat calibration, so you may need to address those here. Uh, when you have both problems in an image, you might have gradient due to light pollution as well as some fall off, it's often best to put them together and deal with them both as a subtractive and see if you're dealing with it. And if you still have some fall if you want to deal with, you could do another pass using division to correct that. So in order to subtract the gradients, what we need to do is create an accurate model for what that gradient is, and then we can subtract it. DBE provides control of how the gradient model is created. There are three ways this can be done. You can use automatically place sampling grids across the image. You can also choose places you wish to sample manually, or you can do a combination where you might start with an auto grid and then modify that grid by hand. And this is what I typically do. 
So we want to sample across the image in order to be able to build this model. Um, how many samples should we use? Um, a few samples can be good because what we really want to do is pull off a nice linear model without a lot of discontinuities to it. Uh, on the other hand, if we have a more complex gradient, we might need to have more samples. In general, the best practice recommendations is to have between 5 and 10 samples per row and have a sampling box size of between 10 and 15 pixels. Personally, I often use larger sample squares and a bit more of them, and I seem to have good results with that. Now, in order to generate those squares, the first thing you have to do is you need to click on the image of interest. Uh, this is a dynamic process. By doing that, you create a com connection between uh, these two. So now we can come down to my sample generation area in here. And I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to have a sample radius of 75 pixels. This is much bigger than most people recommend, but I, I tend to like working with this. Um, and then we'll keep it at about 10 samples uh, per row. And we push the generate button. When we do this, we find that we have just a few boxes being selected. Now, why is that? It's because DBE has some rules about how it creates those sampling boxes. And in the modeling parameters, there's a tolerance uh, adjustment, which talks about uh, how high in intensity uh, a box can be selected. There's a shadows relaxation parameter, which talks about how we can select boxes on the low end. And then there's a smoothing factor. The default out-of-the-box term of 0.5 for the tolerance often restricts this way too much. So we could come in here and we could change that. So we could put a 1 in there. And let's see what that does for us. We're going to hit the Generate button once again. And you'll notice now we have more sampling, but we're still avoiding both the brightest areas and the darkest areas. And in the brightest areas, that's not a big surprise because when you look here, this brightness is almost as bright as some of the nebulosity in the target. So you can see why it might want to shy away from that. But for our purposes, we really want to have a grid across the whole area. So let's double this and go up to two. We'll hit generate once again. And now we have a sampling that goes all the way across. And I could potentially use this. If I hit the check mark now, I'll go ahead and I'll create the model. But if you look in the target image correction area, the correction is none. There is no, there's no fixing that's going to go on here. And the reason for that is quite often what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to take a look at what the background model looks like and make sure it's something you're happy with before you really execute on it. So why don't we go ahead and do that and see what the model looks like when we use it just like this. All right, so now we have a background model that's been computed. I'm going to turn on the STF and we see that this has a kind of choppy looking nature to it. And that's because we're using a relatively low resolution STF. Let's switch over to a 24 bit STF. And when we do that, we see that we have a pretty good gradient coming in here. And we could use that to, to uh, normalize the image, to correct the image. But if you look carefully, it's not that uniform. If you notice, there's sort of this bright blip in here. And the reason there's a bright blip in here is when you look at our sampling, we have samples that are actually hitting the target area. So we're picking up some of the brightness from this galaxy. That's causing kind of a dimple. Now with an even grid like this, if I was to apply this to the image, let's take a look at what result I would get. All right, let's shrink this down a bit. And apply STF. Now maybe I'll go a little bit bigger. Now, if you look at this carefully, um, you can see that there seems to be a dark area right around the galaxy here. And then it gets brighter around it. You sort of have this dark hole in there. And the reason you have that is that we overcorrected in the area of the galaxy. And that dimple that we were originally seeing in the model here is impacting the correction that's going on there. So this is not a desirable result. So this is not the best model. And why is that? That's because we have a pretty precise pattern of sampling going across, and it's not sensitive to what's underneath it. What we really want to do is make sure we're having samples taken from only the background sky. 
So what I need to do here is begin to change that. And I'm going to change that in two ways. I want to make sure that I have no squares on top of the target signal. Uh, and the second thing I want to look at to see if there's any bright stars in any of my sample boxes. So I'm going to remove some of these and I'm going to move some of these to avoid that. So right in here, clearly that's not one I want to deal with. If I click on it, it turns green and I can actually see this scaled up and I can see what's behind it. Uh, but I can also get rid of it by hitting this X. So I'm going to clear that one out of here. I'm going to clear all the boxes out of here that are even remotely close to the uh, galaxy itself. I don't want it to pick up on, on anything there. And basically what you want to do is um, anything from any, anything from the target that you want left alone, you don't want to be sampling across. You don't want that to be used as you're creating your model. I think I'll take this one out. And this one. And then I think we've pretty much avoided uh, the uh, galaxy. Now I want to take a look and see if there's any bright stars in any of my sampling boxes. Uh, in general, small stars will be handled well. Let's take a look at this box. You can see a map here. And the black areas are areas that will not be used by the model. Uh, so it looks like it's getting rid of the star. But the concern here is on brighter stars, it may pick up a little bit of the halo. And if that's the case, it may distort the statistics for that box. So what I tend to do is I just move it. And if I just nudge that box over, I can make sure there's no stars in it. And so I can go through and do that for all the boxes in here. I haven't really changed the positioning in a dramatic way, but I made sure that what they're sampling is truly background sky. One other cautionary tale I ought to mention here is that if you have an area with IFN, Integrated Flux Nebula, that's very faint. You want to make sure you're not sampling that as well, because otherwise DBE will be uh, be eliminating signal that you are really trying to go after and preserve. Okay, that's probably pretty good. So now I've got an adjusted map, which is started from the uh, full grid, and then I edited out those things I didn't think should be there. So why don't we go ahead and we're going to try creating another run at this. Okay, and so now we have a different model. And we'll bring him up, put him in 24, pull this out of the way. And if you look at this, this, this dimple that's in this one, you no longer see in here. Now we have a nice gradient in there. And so we would expect that that would work pretty well to normalize this model. So at this point in time, I can come down here and decide what I want to do. Now, typically what I would do in a case like this, I set this up for subtraction. Um, in this case, I'm going to discard the background model because I already computed it. Um, and the other thing I'm probably going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to fix this image right in place. And at that point I can execute. And if I get rid of this, I can put the ATF back in. And what you're going to see here is the gradient that was so noticeable, noticeable before has been cleaned up. Um, and we have a nice flat field to deal with. Now I can go ahead and do this for the other colors. Now when I open up my color image and I take a look at it, I don't see any gradients left. I don't see a color gradient. So handling the gradients on each of the layers uh, seems to have done what I need to do. And there's nothing residual here that I have to worry about. Had I some residual color gradients in here, I could have applied it once again to this particular version of the image. The final tip I'd like to mention is that sometimes when you're doing this, you can spend quite a bit of work creating a grid, moving it, uh, modifying it, getting the model the way you want. Um, and sometimes you don't want to have to repeat your work. So another handy trick is to take a version of DBE with your final solutions in it. You can drag it off to the desktop and I'll rename this DBE Alt. <laughs> And the idea is I can now use this as a starting point with my other images, which can be quite handy. Or if I ever wanted to go back in time and rework the images I had here, I can do that as well.